Welcome back. In keeping with our conversation about starting the new year doing good, I can't think of a better way to do good than to really take into consideration the little beings, the weak beings among us, the ones that have no voice. And here to speak to that is Susan Pierce, the founder of Red Bucket Equine Rescue in Chino Hills. In 2008, Susan received a call about an abandoned, starved horse um, whose barn manager didn't see a need to feed her because he wasn't being paid. So Susan went out and got 50 pounds of carrots and after six and a half hours was able to board this horse on a trailer and bring her home with her. She named her Harlow and she promised her a life of love and rest. And Harlow has lived, has been living that life with Susan since then. Susan, welcome to the show and thank you. Thank you for all the amazing work you do. We, we talk often about animal rescue, whether it's dog, cat, horse, um, other, other animals in general, farm animals. But in this case, horses are our focus for today. And there's no one I'd rather have here share, you know, sharing with us than you. So thank you for coming back on the show. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure. And I can't, emphasize enough how much I, I believe in your mission and the work that you're doing and how much I miss my volunteer days at Red Bucket. Um, and just for our audience members who don't know you, aside from the quick story that I just told, why don't you tell us a little more about Red Bucket? Oh, goodness. So much to tell. Um, Red Bucket is a nonprofit organization. We rely solely on donations and support of people who want to see our good work continue. Our mission has three parts and very simply, it's to save horses. Um, horses that are high risk, slaughter bound, starving and suffering, the old and the forgotten. And the second part of our mission is to restore health, dignity and trust. And then finally, the third part is to make a decision for the horse about their lifetime. Some of our horses are um, wonderfully able to be rehomed and they go to adoptive homes where we continue to stay in touch with the adopters and ensure that the horse has truly a forever home. And many of the animals who come to us have been abused beyond our ability to responsibly rehome them. And then we give them sanctuary for life and we take that very seriously. I think that's an amazing part of the conversation because people don't necessarily think about rescue as a commitment for life. And in, in this case, and in many cases, it truly is. And so how, how does that look? Because it it is a shift, I think, in the philosophy of rescue we were talking earlier that um, people are familiar with the dog and cat philosophy of rescue, where if the animal can't be rehomed, then you euthanize them. But for horses, that that doesn't really work, at least not in your view of the world. And And I think there's a philosophy around dog and cat that's changing too, because we are hearing much more about a commitment for life and a pro-life and living approach. Listen, we're talking to an audience that's aging every day and none of us wants to be considered of no value just because we've got some gray hair. Okay, so um, loaded question. Um, until five years ago, the movement for equine rescue truly was make sure there's a safety net, make sure that horses are matched responsibly and make sure that the promises are kept. Um, in the last five years that has devolved and the messages now are if you can't rehome a horse in 30 days, euthanize them. Um, if the horse is old, euthanize them. If the horse is injured or damaged, euthanize them. And I'll just tell you right now, our organization and those who support us absolutely find that to be reprehensible. Rescue doesn't mean for today or tomorrow. It means making sure 
that there's a responsible plan for the lifetime of that animal. And it is one of the things that differentiates us. And it's one of the things that makes our work very difficult because as horses get older, you know, they incur more expenses. Just like we do. Healthcare. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. So why, why has the philosophy and the conversation changed? Is it that there are just so many more animals than there were five years ago? What happened? The animal, the number's about the same and it's, Horrendous. You know, we have 130 to 150,000 unwanted horses in this country that go to slaughter every year. And so rather than solving for the root cause, I think the easier is just to solve for the immediacy in terms of what the symptoms are. Too many horses, you know, get rid of the ones that don't fit our stereotype of what good looks like. And uh, that's, that's a problem. We we want to expand the narrative in this country to bring more compassion and more value for life. And that is, that is what we're, we're trying to do. And we're in a minority. Yeah, which I, which I find incredibly hard to hear and, and believe. Uh, not that I don't believe it, but it's, it is an unfortunate state. And so over the last, I mean, you've been at this for a while now. So how many horses have you rehomed, rehabilitated, and how many do you have under forever care at Red Bucket right now? Okay, love to answer the question. And that's part of the problem. Okay. That question is part of the problem because what's happening is there are agencies that are looking at numbers that are going to reward the numbers of adopted horses. But there's no um, responsibility about whether or not the horse stays in the home. So I could quote you enormous numbers that would be very impressive. Um, and that would allow me to get grant money, which I'm not <laughs> really not able to get. Because our goal is to make sure that when we rehome a horse, the horse is matched for that home, that that, that new adopter has support so that animal can stay as a family member. So we have adopted over 400 horses and we have um, the best statistics that I'm aware of in the nation around you know, forever homes, horses staying in the home. Our return rate is very low because we're careful. But the movement right now is to reduce the standards and just get rid of the horses, knowing that some of them will fall through the cracks, knowing that some of them will end up back in the slaughter pipeline. So in our work, we, we have saved thousands of horses. In terms of horses that we're able to bring in through our gates, you know, it's, it's up into 532-ish right now. Um, and the goal is let's keep the horses alive. And so that's where the numbers, you know, get to be kind of funny. We used to put numbers on our shirts to take a look at numbers saved and then numbers adopted out. We're not doing that anymore because it's, it's treating the horse like it's a number versus like a life. Right. So let's, let's talk about that for a second because the whole point of this is to establish ongoing care and a future program plan for the animal and their human and to make sure that the human actually is looking out into the future, not just looking to adopt a pet. And then should something happen to the human, like we've seen over the last number of years, I mean, wildfires or pandemic or you know inflation, all things that impact people's ability to actually spend money on an added family member. And you, know, you have a choice, you can either rehome your horse or you can rehome your least favorite child. So given, given those options, um, I know that you work with people to establish a long-term care plan. How does that look? Well, it starts when the person calls and says, hey, would like to adopt a horse for my daughter. It starts then because people aren't educated and they don't understand the costs that are associated with horses. Mm -hmm. And very seldom do they think about something catastrophic that could happen in the family. 
And so from the very beginning, part of our involvement with an adopter is through the doorway of support and education and asking questions to get people to think, um, what, by the way, what happens to that horse when your daughter goes to college? Oh, oh, right. That kid is actually going to go to college. What happens to the horse then? And that is a big problem for the horse. Um, and then, of course, you know, people who call us, we spend so much time counseling people. Um, but, the, you know, or people, this is the other problem. People think, oh, we'll go to a, a rescue and we'll get a free horse. And they're not free, by the way. But uh, a free horse or an adopted horse costs as much to feed and maintain as a horse that costs ten thousand dollars right and right. people don't oftentimes really take that into account either so i know that our viewers many of them are horse owners many are horse lovers and many are just appreciators of life in all forms and from our perspective i know that doing good often equates to writing a check or, you know, some dollar signs behind it. It also equates to understanding that not all horses have to work for their living, but they can be great companions. They can be, um, you know, great family members just by being there and adding the value that they do. But what, what would you recommend if someone wants to follow our philosophy of, you know, start the year by doing something good? What could they do right now that could help them get involved or support Red Bucket's efforts? Okay, a lot. And I don't want to discount the, the donation. And it doesn't have to come with a lot of zeros after it. We have some donors who have been giving us $5 a month for, for years. And for that, we are very grateful. We call it drop in the bucket. And, you know, if you just do the math, if you have a thousand people that are giving, you know, $5 a month, that's significant. If we have 25,000 people that are giving $5 a month, I cannot tell you what, what that matters to us. And it's a rounding error for most households. Um, so, um, yes, we survive solely on donations and going into economic times when people are getting a little worried. I think they think that their $5, $10, $20 isn't, doesn't matter. And it does. So I would say it matters. Estate planning matters. Um, we survived this year because somebody thought about us and it made the difference between us being able to survive or not. So those things all matter. Um, I would say um, knowledge matters. I would say when people think about um, wanting to give a skill that they have, you know, we need lawyers, we need accountants, we need marketing. Um, so there are so many skills that people have that they've cultivated over a lifetime that they may not be using right now. And they'd love to use it for, you know, for a cause. Um, so those things matter. We're a volunteer organization. And it doesn't mean that people have to be able to drive out to Chino Hills and clean a stall. It could be giving skills or knowledge. Amazing. There is a lot people can do. And I hope our viewers are, are really listening closely. I especially love the donating your time and your service, mm -hmm. even if you can do it remotely. Because as you said, um, you're a volunteer organization and that's one thing I know for sure. There are so many organizations in the world and none of them ever say we have too much. No. So the gratitude is, is always abundant. And Susan, um, where can they find more information? Uh, well, our website is www.redbucketrescue.org. Um, so that would be a great place, uh, great place to start. And uh, I read all of the emails that come in. And so I welcome people to reach out or, um, you know, phone, phone us and uh, appreciate people's interest and curiosity about our work. That's where it starts, the curiosity and the communication and most of all, compassion. So thank you. Thank you for the amazing work that you do. Thank you for taking the time to come visit with us. And I look forward to seeing you again. As do I. Thank you very much and Happy New Year. 
Thank you. You too. And we'll be right back. 